Hey y'all, Prof. J.B. Taylor here. Um, hoping to get Periscope online here right quick. There we go. Make sure we're doing that right. Okay, good, 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 good. All right. <clears throat> hope everybody's having a really good Sunday, and I hope that you're staying cool on a day like today because it is super hot. It's not just regular hot, man. It's super hot. At least it is uh, uh, here in Chicago. All right. So as always, I come on every week and I pray and ask the Lord, you know, what he wants me to say, what he wants me to deliver to the body of Christ. And I can't stress to you how important that is. Important that is, if you're any kind of minister, that you pray over whatever words God is going to have you release, because you always want to be sure you're releasing what the Lord is saying and not what you think, because he knows better than we do. He knows what he wants. He knows what the people need to hear. He knows who's in the audience. God knows all that. So just want to encourage those of you that are ministers to be sure you keep your ministry surrendered to the leading of the Lord. Okay? So, as always, I ask the Lord, and the word for this week is restore. Restore. So we're going to look at a very familiar passage of Scripture, and we're going to dive right in. So let's have a quick word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Lord, for your mighty word. Thank you, Lord, for your prophetic word. As you be in the midst of all that we say and do, let your word come forth the way you want it to, O oh God, and let it touch the hearts you would have it touch. And we thank you for it, and we believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. So, Joel 2.25. I'm going to read that in the King James. <clears throat> and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. <clears throat> ESV, and I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent among you. Okay, Berean Study Bible. Uh, I will repay you for the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the young locust, the destroying locust, and the devouring locust, my great army that I sent against you. Okay, lots to understand in that verse, and lots to do to get to our word, which is restore. Now, it says in a couple of translations, God said, I will restore to you. In a couple of translations, like the NIV and the Berean, God says, I will repay you. Okay, that phrase there, I will repay the Hebrew word there is shalam, shalam, and it means to make amends. It means to be complete, sound, uh, finished, ended, be sound, uninjured. That's kind of a legal term, uh, restore you to the place you were before you had the injury or the loss, make you whole again, make safe, make whole, or make good. So what God is saying there is that he's going to make you whole. He's going to make good on everything that got lost in the destruction. Okay? Super, 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 super important if you are, are living a life of dreams interrupted. If you're living a life where you had a particular dream or dreams and you weren't able to pursue those dreams and you didn't live them out, then this is one of the promises that God makes that he will make you whole. Okay? He will make you complete again. He will make amends for what is lost. But let me hasten to say here, okay, let me hasten to say, too many times in my life I have heard people teach this verse, just kind of, just kind of teach it without talking about the other things that you have to do to bring this to come to pass, okay? You can't just walk up to God and claim this verse, that God will restore to me the years. <laughs> if you are out of the will of God, I can't stress that enough. You cannot claim God's word. That's why I do so much teaching on genie concept. You cannot claim God's word against him. Okay? You have to be in the will of God for this to take effect. For God to truly restore you, the only way you can truly be restored is by someone that had the original picture in the first place. So what that means in a very practical sense is that God is the only one that knows who you're supposed to be 
and what your life is supposed to be like. It's entirely possible as we go through life that we don't listen to the Lord, we don't listen to the Good Shepherd, and we take detours. We go off on our own. We go chasing after things that God never meant for us to have because we don't trust Him to lead us to the green pastures and the still waters. Okay? So many of us go through that. Now, some people learn how to hear the voice of God as children, and they stay faithful. And even through hard trials and tribulations, they still live a life of victory because they learned as children to lit, to H, excuse me, um, excuse me, Alberta, to HBO, to hear, believe, and obey. To hear what God is saying, believe what he's telling you is true, and obey the voice of the Lord. If you learn that at like six or seven years old, then it doesn't matter what comes against you in life. If you learn how to HBO. But many of us hear the voice of God and we run. Or many of us hear the voice of God and we fight. Why do we run and why do we fight? We run and we fight because we don't believe that God loves us. And we don't believe that what he's offering us or calling us to is better than the life we'd be living on our own. That's the thing. You know how I know that's true? I know that's true because nobody runs from value. Nobody runs from value. Whatever it is that you're into, if you see it on sale, you're going to stop what you're doing and go buy you two, three, or four at a reduced price because you're getting it at a good value. So nobody runs from value. So the only reason we run from God and the only reason we fight God is because we really honestly don't believe that what he's offering is of a greater value than what we already have. Okay? You have to believe that what God is calling you to the life that God wants you to live and the person God wants you to be is a better life than the life you have now and a better person, the highest version of yourself. And the highest version of yourself is where the image of God is fully restored and at work in your life. In other words, Christ in you. You can't become better than Christ in you. I don't care what you accomplish. I don't care how in shape you are physically. I don't care how many degrees you have. I don't care how much money you make. I don't care how pretty your spouse is. I don't care how successful your children are. You can't become better than Christ in you. That's why God says you can live your whole life, be financially successful, and still end up a fool because you didn't invest with him. Okay? So whatever God is calling you to, he's calling you to the highest version of yourself. And the highest version of yourself is where the flesh is crucified Anything that's not like God is crucified and the Christ in you can stand up. Okay? So if you are ready to do that, then this promise kicks in that God will restore you the years, God will repay you for the years. But you can't claim this promise if you're out of the will of God. Okay? If you have no intention of following God and you have no intention of serving God, then you can't come you know, bringing this promise, living any kind of way you want to and talk about what the Lord said he restored the years. And it just, it just frustrates me many times when in our religious experiences, we don't hear clergy people teaching us the whole truth. Because that's how people get the idea in their head that you can live any kind of way you want to and then God will bless you anyway. That is not true. That is not true. You must learn how to HBO, hear, believe, and obey. You have to get in the will of God. You have to learn how to hear what the Lord is actually saying to you, believe that he loves you, and what he's saying to you is actually the best for you, and then obey that. Then you have put yourself in a position for to claim this promise that God will restore to you the years because what happens when we're out of the will of God is that our substance or our efforts or our increase gets devoured, and that's what comes up next. So it says, again, Berean Study Bible, I will repay you for the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. The young locusts, the destroying locusts, and the devouring locusts. Now, these are different words in Hebrew, and they can mean a couple different things, which is why they're translated differently in English. That first phrase, the first time it says is, I will uh, repay you for the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. Swarming locusts there, that word there is arbe. Arbe, and it just means locust. It's a certain kind of locust. Locust that swarm. But the next word we see here in English that's translated the young locust, that word in Hebrew is yelek. 
yelik, and that's another word that means locust, uh, a creeping locust, or a young locust. That's the distinction there. Next time we see that phrase, next up we see the destroying locust. In Hebrew, that word is, come on, come on. You know, everything always trying to freeze when you're online. Uh, anyway, it looks like my uh, my computer has frozen. Of course it has. For whatever. Ah, there we go. So that word there is causeal. Causeal. And that word there means grasshopper. Grasshopper or stripping locusts. Okay? So we've got uh, swarming locusts. We've got creeping locusts. We've got uh, grasshopper locust, that's destroying locust, and the devouring locust. Now let's look at that word. That word there is gauzam. Gauzam, and that word means a gnawing locust, and it also can mean caterpillar. So look at that. Uh, creeping, gnawing, devouring, okay, swarming. So what does that mean? That means uh, in a practical sense, that's why you're so frustrated and tired when you're out of the will of God, because all of your efforts are being devoured. It doesn't matter how hard you work, looks like you can't get ahead. It doesn't look like how well you plan that business, looks like you can't get it off the ground. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how much effort you put in, it looks like you're not getting a return or a harvest back, because it's just being eaten up, that's what that's talking about. Okay, And that's what happens when you get out of the will of God. That's why I, I keep trying to explain to everybody that you can't just live any kind of way you want to and expect God to bless you anyway. That is not going to happen. And I am so sorry. I am so aggrieved as a prophet of God for the children of God that have believed for quite some time now that you can just live any kind of way you want to and God's going to bless you anyway. That is not true. What actually happens is when you get out from under the authority of Christ, when you are out of the will of God, when you are disobedient and unbelieving, when God has offered you a plan and you tell God that you don't want his plan, you'd rather have your plan, then this kicks in. Because when you run in your plan, you're going to end up so tired. <laughs> you're going to be so tired running your plan. You're going to be so tired. You're going to feel like no matter what you do, it's like you can't make ends meet. You're going to feel like that even if you have financial prosperity, you're still not happy. You're going to feel something gnawing at you like something's missing. I mean, just all kinds of things happen when those locusts have come to eat up your increase. You can work for years and then still end up with nothing. You know why? Because you're out of the will of God. you got to get right with God first. That's why the Lord said in Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things shall be added unto you. So if you want God to restore to you the years, you've got to get right with him first. You've got to go to Jesus Christ and you have to ex accept him, not just as Savior, but accept him as Lord. You've got to lay down your plan. And I know many of us don't want to lay down our plan. But the only reason you don't want to lay down your plan is because you don't believe that the Lord's is better. But his is better. His version of you is better. His plan for you is better. His thoughts about you are better than your thoughts about you. The way he sees you is better than the way you see you. The spouse that he would pick for you is way better than the one that you would pick for you. And however long, however many years it takes for you to believe that, and if it takes a long time, you're just going to burn up a lot of years, a lot of years that you could have been happy, a lot of years that you could have been successful, a lot of years that you could have been way further down the road if you had believed that God loved you and if you had believed that his plan was better. And if you had believed that his version of you is actually the best and the highest version of you. Because if you don't want that, I guarantee you're going to end up much lower than you could have been. Even if you got money. Okay? So... When we get right with God, because when you read the whole context of Joel 2, you can see better what I'm talking about, because I just isolated this one verse, Joel 2.25. But when you read the whole second chapter of Joel, you can see that what Joel is talking about there is about Israel returning to God and getting right with him. 
And when you get right with God and you get back in the will of God, then God says he's going to restore to you the years with these different type of swarming, creeping, and destroying grasshoppers, caterpillars, and locusts that have come to eat up your, har your harvest. Then it says, my great army that I sent against you. Now that's a very strong statement for the prophet Joel to make, for God to be saying, what is God talking about, my great army that I sent against you? Okay? Well, to understand that, we have to go to another verse. And that verse is in the book of James. And that is James 4 and 6. James 4, 6 says, but he gives us more grace. This is why it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. One more time. Berean Study Bible, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In King James it says, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Okay? What does that mean? That means when you are fighting God and you are fighting the will of God, you are walking in pride. And God is actively fighting against you. He's opposing you. You know why? Because you're telling the maker that you think you know better than him. You're telling the maker that you think that your plan is better than his plan. You think, you're telling the maker that you think that you can run your life better than he can run your life. And that is an offense to his love. That is an offense to his truth. That is an offense to his righteousness. And that is an offense to his holiness. That's the clay, the creature that's made out of clay and breath, trying to tell the potter, the creator, that we know better. That's pride. Because we did not self-invent. You did not invent yourself. You didn't invent people. You didn't invent men. You didn't invent women. And you didn't invent you. Yet you're trying to tell the maker that you think you have a better idea about how all this is supposed to go than he does. That's pride. And the Bible says in James 4 and 6 that God opposes the proud. And God resists the proud in the King James Version. So that means that God is actively fighting against us when we're walking in pride. And God is going to send the locust, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, the creeping locust, the devouring locust, the swarming locust, locust against your harvest. And if you're outside of the will of God, it's not going to work out. Okay? Until you learn, as James 4, 6 says, to humble yourself, then you get grace. God gives grace to the humble. Not this, this teaching that says God just covers you with his grace regardless just because Jesus died. That's wrong. The Bible says that's wrong. The Bible says that if you're walking in your human pride and you think your plan is better than God, God's going to resist you. God's going to oppose you. God's going to fight you. Okay? So that's why some of you have been out there for a long time, but you just can't get ahead. You feel like you keep suffering loss. You feel like that things aren't going the way they're supposed to go. What you have to do is stop where you are right now and surrender. You have to go before God and stop and tell God that you're going to stop fighting him. Surrender to what God is trying to do. Stop fighting him. Stop telling the maker that you know better. You don't know how to pick a spouse better than the one that, in, that invented spouses. You don't know how to make money better than the one that invented money. Okay? You don't know how to be who you are better than the one that invented you. And if you think so, you're still in pride. So if you want to get back in grace, then you have to surrender. You have to stop where you are right now and tell God you're not going to fight him anymore. Tell God that I, what Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. I'm going to lay down my will, my plans, my ideas, my agenda, and I'm going to listen to you, God. I'm going to, as Bishop Jake said recently, I'm going to stop trying to be the teacher. I'm going to stop trying to tell God something, and I'm going to become the student, and I'm going to let God teach me. Then, Joel 2 and... uh 25 kicks in, and then God will restore to you the years, okay? Because now you're back on his plan. Now you're back in his will. Now you're back uh, getting on the path that God wants you to be on, and that's the path of prosperity, true prosperity, where you have not just a financial harvest, but you have peace, and you have joy, and you have integrity, and you have so many things, 
And again, when you find the right spouse, all the things, the good things that God has for you are in the center of, of his will. But to get to the center of the will of God, you literally have to let go of everything that's not what God wants. That means you literally have to stop being a sight walker and become a faith walker. Okay, if you want to go to school, you have to go before the Lord and ask him, number one, is it your will for me to go to school? And number two, is this the right season? If the answer is yes and you want me to go, when do you want me to go? Am I supposed to be taking summer classes? Do I start in the fall? Do you want me to wait two years from now to go to school? You have to ask God. And thirdly, where do you want me to go? If you do that, God is going to bless every step of that process. If you just jump up... <laughs> and decide to go back to school on your own, just anything could happen because that wasn't the will of God for you. You follow what I'm saying? So if God sends a great army to devour our harvest, that's because we are walking in pride and he is opposing what we're doing because what we're doing is an offense to his love and what we're doing is an offense to his holiness and his righteousness and his plan. We're trying to tell the Creator that we know better, and that is pride, and that is sin. So we must repent of our sin, we must lay down our self-will, we must take up our cross and crucify everything in our lives that's not like God, and get back into, in the center of the will of God, and then this verse kicks in, and then God's going to restore everything that the devil took from you, and God's going to restore everything that wicked people took from you, God's going to restore everything that, that you maybe didn't appreciate the first time. God's going to restore once you get back in the center of his will. Okay? So, therefore, my people, I say unto you, listen to my prophet and get in the center of my will. Come before me and lay down your plans. Come before me and stop trying to teach me. Come before me and stop trying to tell me how it goes. Stop trying to be the teacher but become the student. And as you come before me and as you lay down your ideas and your agenda, I will show you my will. I will give you my words, my ideas, my plans, and my plans are better than yours. I can do more with your life than you can do on your own. So surrender to me today. Do not delay. The day you hear my voice, do not harden your heart. And as you begin to walk in obedience to what I want for you, the prosperity, the blessing, the joy, the peace, and the desires of your heart will spring forth anew, and I'll restore to you the years. Everything that was devoured, I will bring back, says the Spirit of the living God. Amen and amen. All right, so, amen. Obedience, right. So, uh, that was a good word. That's a good word. So, I encourage everybody to do what the Holy Ghost say. Okay? Surrender to Christ. Stop trying to teach God, stop trying to be the teacher and become the student and stop trying to do it on our own and do what the Lord is telling us to do. Then we can walk in Joel, uh, Joel 2.25 in the fullness and God can restore to us all that we lost when we were over here out of the will of God in pride and disobedience because we don't tell the creator how we go. He made us. He tells us what to do, and we follow him. Okay? All right. Do I have any prayer requests? If I have any prayer requests, please put them on the screen right now, and we will pray. And if not, I will pray a closing prayer, and we'll be done for this week. I'm super excited. Remember, I always tell you that anything I'm preaching and teaching or prophesying about, I'm walking in it myself. So areas in my life where I miss God, I am excited about, uh, uh, I've had to repent, in some areas, and I'm excited about getting, getting back in the will of God. And, oh, Lord, okay. My parents go went off, and I'm like, what happened? I'm like, oh, I should have known what happened. Here's a phone call. But anyway, so, uh, yeah, so, I might have prayed for me for restoration. Okay. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for Imani McNeil, oh God, that you would get her back into your will, oh God, that whatever has been happening in the past that was not of you, that you would bring her back right in the center of your will, O oh God, and that she would learn how to crucify everything that didn't come from you and learn how to HBO, hear, believe, and obey your voice, that she might get in the center of the will of God and that you might restore to her the years and everything that's been devoured will come back. 
We thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. God bless you, Imani. All right. Any other prayer requests? All right. I'm going to pray a uh, uh, closing prayer. Thank you, God, for getting in the center of your will. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you, for God, for forgiving us and being patient. And thank you for giving us another chance to get in the center of your will, to stop being the teacher and learn how to become the student that you might restore and renew and bring back to us everything that we've lost through disobedience and unbelief, everything that the devil stole, oh God. And we thank you for it. We're excited about it. We're excited about surrendering our own will so that we might get in the center of your will. And we're excited about what you're going to do. And as you continue to bless us and lead us, we'll be careful to give you all the glory. We thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right, God bless you. God bless you so much. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll be here my uh, same time next week, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. God bless you. Have a good 4th of July holiday coming up. Uh, definitely be safe. Spend time with family. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. God bless. <music>